Good morning. The biblical worldview is not the worldview of the 21st century. In the biblical worldview, there is the material, there is the mental, the psychological, but yet there is another dimension, which what I would call the spiritual, what the Bible would call the spiritual dimension. And people are either ruled by good or evil. And some people completely surrender to the darkness. And darkness is seen by the fruits of darkness. And a list that we can find in scripture are lies, impurity, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties. These are things that flow from a person who is controlled by the dark side. While the light side, the Holy Spirit, produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, after you've known somebody for a long period of time, and then when you see something about that person and it throws you for a loop, you might say, well, who is this? And that's kind of what we see in this passage today. The disciples have spent a lot of time with Jesus and they thought they knew him. But because of what he does, they say, who is this? Who is this? Now, some people think that evil really isn't real in the, the modern world. But the LA County Sheriff's Department has a division for satanic crimes. And there is a book that Mark Brubeck wrote, The Rise of Fallen Angels. And he lists stories of deliverance. And he tells a story about a new believer named Ahmed in the Southern Philippines. And fellow villagers were very critical of his faith and challenged him to cast out a devil out of a disturbed woman, saying that if he did so, they would put their faith in Christ. After praying and waiting on the Lord, Ahmed confronted the powers controlling the woman. What ensued is proof of Christ's power. Words flowed from her lips, he writes, indicating the battle to come. You are nobody to me. I can eat you alive, a voice from within the woman said. The only one I am afraid of is the Holy One within you. The voice continued, Ahmed, then ordered the demon to depart in the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior. The demon said that he would go away, and after some physical torment, the woman became sane and free from Satan. Jesus and his disciples have decided to cross the lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and to venture into a Gentile territory on the eastern shore. This Jewish Messiah 
is now moving into the non-Jewish world. He'd already signaled that he would in chapter 2 and chapter 4 and chapter 7. But here we see this happening further. Today we're looking at Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 39. Jesus' encounter across the lake. See, Jesus displays his unique power over the natural elements and over the supernatural oppression. Jesus has power over the natural forces of wind and a storm. And the disciples recognize his supernatural dimension. He is again recognized by demons to be the Son of God. And he frees a demon-possessed man simply with his authority. And the non-Jewish people of this region are concerned. They're fearful. This cured demoniac becomes a witness for Jesus in this non-Jewish territory. Chapter 8, verse 22. One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and started out. As they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water, and they were in real danger. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we're going to be drowned! When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. Suddenly, the storm stopped, and all was calm. Then he asked them, Where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They asked each other. When he gives a command, even the wind and the waves obey him. So they arrived in the region of the Gerasenes across the lake from Galilee. As Jesus was climbing out of the boat, a man who was possessed by demons came out to meet him. For a long time he had been homeless and naked, living in the tombs outside the town. As soon as he saw Jesus, he shrieked and fell down in front of him. Then he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Please, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already commanded the evil spirit to come out of him. The spirit had often taken control of the man. Even when he was placed under guard and put in chains and shackles, he simply broke them and rushed out into the wilderness completely under the demon's power. Jesus demanded, What is your name? Legion, he replied, for he was filled with many demons. The demons kept begging Jesus not to send them into the bottomless pit back to hell. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby, and the demons begged him to let them enter into the pigs, so Jesus gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man, and he entered the pigs, and the entire herd plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw it, they fled to a nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered 
around Jesus and they saw the man who had been freed from the demons. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully clothed, perfectly sane, and they were afraid. Then those who had seen what happened told the others how the demon-possessed man had been healed. And all the people and the region of the Gerasenes begged Jesus to go away and leave them alone, for a great wave of fear swept over them. So Jesus returned to the boat and left, crossing to the other side of the lake. The man who had been freed from the demons begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him home, saying, No, go back to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. So he went all through the towns, proclaiming the great things Jesus had done for him. Most of the ministry of Christ was focused around the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, Nazareth, where he grew up, Capernaum. But on the other side of the lake, which was the Hellenistic, the, the, uh, the non-Jewish part of, of those who lived there, there was a location called Decapolis, the Ten Cities, with a large non-Jewish population, and they had large herds of pigs unclean to the Jewish people. The lake is about 30 miles east of the Mediterranean, situated in a bowl-shaped section of the Jordan Valley. It's part of a great rift that runs from Syria all the way south into Africa, down through to Mozambique. This lake is surrounded by hills on all sides, which is why the winds and the calmness of the sea can fluctuate so violently and suddenly because the cooler air from the higher elevations flows down the slopes and collides with the warmer air and churns the lake. These winds continue to this day. This region up above is known as the Golan Heights. You've heard that in news reports. In 1992, the winds from such a storm as the one that we read about here generated waves of 10 feet high and crashed into the city of Tiberias on the western shore, inflicting considerable damage. So this is, is something that happened every once in a while. The fishermen were aware of it, but they were panicked because they had seen it before. Master, master, we are perishing. All of a sudden, the lake's trans tranquility is shattered by this fierce gale. And it's, uh, it, it descends down. Mark, when he records this story, he uses the word megas, great, to, to uh, it's a great shaking is how Matthew put it. It was like a, a seismic shaking. This was no ordinary storm, but these extraordinary storms happened every once in a while. Jesus was perfectly sleeping and at rest, and then trouble came. The disciples panicked. They were afraid that they were going to die. 
Master, we're perishing. And only at the word of Christ, be still. And the storm was over. There was no human solution. They were in the middle of the lake, in this small boat. And the only thing that could rescue them was the Lord's words, be still. Psalms 65, 5 and 7 reads, O God of our salvation, you who are the trust of all the ends of the earth and the farthest sea, who establishes the mountains by his strength, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, or Psalms 89, verse 9. You rule the swelling of, of the sea. When it rises, you still them. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep, for he spoke and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens, they went down to, to the depths, their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He caused the storm to still, so the waves of the sea were hushed. And so they were glad because they were quiet. Psalm 107. 23 and following. See, the disciples learned that they could put their trust in Christ. Peter later wrote to cast all of your anxieties upon him because he was able to handle it. He rebuked the wind and the waves. And their response is, who is this? Who is this? They went to the, 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 the region of the Gerasenes, Gergesa, in several ancient texts. And uh, this was an unclean area. And there is a part of the eastern shore where the ground rises steeply from the water. And these ancient tombs, this man was uncontrollable. They chained him up in these ancient tombs because they didn't want him in the community where they lived. These tombs were ritually unclean to Jews, but yet found a, provided a great home for someone with unclean spirits. And these spirits recognize Jesus instantly. They know that you are the Most High God. That's quite a revelation. They knew what a lot of people didn't know in Israel. The demons knew who Jesus was. This legion of demons. This is not just one demon. This is thousands of demons. Just as a Roman legion is, consists normally of 6,000 soldiers. The imagery here is that there are thousands of demons in this man. That's why the large herd of pigs reveals the reality of what Jesus said. Some people lament all oh, the poor pigs' lives. But the life of several thousand pigs is nothing compared to the life of a man. Jesus gave them permission. He freed this man, this miraculous power, 
had already destroyed these valuable pigs. And these people didn't feel that Jesus was safe to have him around. So they asked him to leave because they were overcome with fear. Fear. Fear can overtake a nation, a community, so easily. The first time I remember seeing fear overtake my world was in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Everyone was afraid because of NORAD being close to Denver. Everyone thought that if a nuclear weapon is launched, we will be the first to go. But yet still in this storm of fear, we huddled down in the hallways like that was going to do something to help us. It only drove the fear deeper into our hearts and minds. And I remember having dreams of escaping Denver in the Rockies just to get away from this type of fear. And that's what, you know, there was, it's, here it's a little different because not only are they afraid, but at the same time, they're amazed. They're amazed because it's beyond anything they have experienced. They've seen demon possession. They've seen demons destroy people but they've never seen the power of God remove the demonic influence in a man who was nuts and crazed and to be sitting there sane and in his right mind, they were extremely uncomfortable. Just get out of here was their sense Leave us alone. Charles Colson wrote a book entitled Loving God. In that book, he talks or writes about Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who lived from 1918 to 2008. He was in a a Siberian work camp. And Solzhenitsyn wrote about these experiences in his own novel, One Day in the Life of Ivan Novosevich. Colson describes Solzhenitsyn's plight as a pattern of backbreaking labor, slow starvation, leading to a hopelessness that became too much to bear. One day, Solzhenitsyn put down his shovel and sat on the bench, knowing full well that such an action could cost him his life. Amid his dejection, he suddenly felt a powerful presence beside him, Hunched over, an old man was drawing a stick through the sand at his feet, making the sign of the cross. Solzhenitsyn stared at that rough outline. His entire perspective shifted. He knew that he was merely one man against the all-powerful Soviet socialist empire. Yet in that moment, he also knew that the hope of all mankind was represented in that simple cross. And through its power, anything was possible. Solzhenitsyn slowly got up, picked up his shovel, and went back to work. 
not knowing that his writings on truth and freedom would one day inflame the whole world. Chuck Colson concluded, such is the power of God's truth, affords one man willing to stand against seemingly hopeless odds. Who is this that commands the sea and the water? Who is this that has authority over demons? One of the great hymns of the Christian faith was written in response to a terrible storm in the 19th century. Horatio Spafford lost his four daughters when an ocean liner sank in the Atlantic. Only his wife survived, and sending a cable to her husband, simply saying, saved alone. Here was a storm that seemingly overwhelmed him. But what did this saint write as he contemplated what had happened? He wrote, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. See, Jesus had performed other exorcisms in chapter four and six and in chapter eight. But this is the first exorcism that occurs in Gentile territory. And it is an exorcism that has a multiple possession. It's a much more intense encounter than the other ones. This miracle is a part of a sequence of four miracles in chapter 8 from verses 22 to 56, where each one represents a, a different sphere of, of God's and Christ's power over death, over evil, over the, the nature, and over multiple demonic activity. To see this man who had formerly been possessed, he's calmly at the feet of Jesus, restored, clothed, and in his sane, sound mind, he was sane. Jesus rescued him from among the tombs and brought him back to the real world again. See, this is a scene and of a picture of how God can change a life out of control to one that is at peace. He wants to travel with Jesus, but Jesus tells him to stay there and be a witness. G.K. Chesterton who wrote apologetic writings that were instrumental in C.S. Lewis's conversion to Christianity, says that when people cease to believe in God, they do not believe in nothing. They believe in anything. Having rejected the only true God, people today are fascinated with transcendent, alternative realities, science fiction, the legends of mythology, fictional beings from, with superhuman powers. Many are obsessed with the occult, witchcraft, seances, Ouija boards, astrology, spiritism, fortune telling, palm reading, anything who can predict the future. 
Oz Guinness wrote about the Western culture, and he writes, early hunters on safari in Africa used to build their fires high at night in order to keep away the animals in the bush. But when the fires burned low in the early hours of the morning, they would see all around them the approaching outline shapes of animals and a ring of encircling eyes in the darkness. When the fire was high, they were far off. But when the fire was low, they approached again. We witnessed the erosion and the breakdown of Christian culture. And they're trying to destroy the culture of the West. So we've seen the vacuum filled with an upsurge of ideas that would have been unthinkable when the fires of the Christian culture were high. Osgott Guinness writes in The Dust of Death, written in 1973. But what he saw in 1973 has only become more magnified. People are inevitably drawn to the power and mystery that is beyond their comprehension. This man who was demon-possessed and how he got to be demon-possessed is unknown. We don't know his name. We don't know how it happened. But all of the believers are part of Satan's kingdom, and they're vulnerable. This man was a Gentile. It may have been his religion, his that he worshipped idols. We don't know the entry point, but the demon seized control of him and compelled him to behave in a bizarre manner, not to put on clothes, Being naked in the desert is not a good idea for very long because the sun will roast you. The insects and the critters will eat you. He's completely vulnerable. He was not living in the house, but in the tombs. He was a man who was not welcome in society. And these demons would seize him and he would become uncontrollable. But God in Christ was able to remove all that craziness He delivered this maniac. And instead of being grateful, they were afraid of the change. See, some people argue that sinners will be convinced if they see a powerful enough miracle. But here's one that you can't avoid, but it's not the case. This clear transformation doesn't result in, oh, I want to be changed too. Get the heck out of here. You scare me. It's hard to, to envision a more powerful transformation but their hearts were like hard-packed roadside soil and the parable of the sower, which the seed of the gospel cannot penetrate. Jesus' mission to the other side of the lake was complete. Another 
prisoner had been liberated. See, these people loved their swine more than they valued this human life. They cared more about those pigs than they cared about this man. And one of life's extreme dangers is to value things more than persons. But this happens all the time in our world. We have created slums and vicious working conditions that make it impossible for people to survive. This man was cured simply by God coming into his life. We live in a world where there are people who are out of control, who don't have a sense of purpose, and they don't respond when they see a changed life all the time. You may be at the beauty parlor here. You may be at dinner and you end up eating with somebody you don't know. It's an opportunity. Go and tell people that you meet every day what Jesus has done for you. See, only when we are witnesses like this man who was a demoniac and had been transformed by the grace of God, sometimes they will listen to you. Sometimes they won't. You can only try. Be a planter of seed. Be a representative of light and a dark world. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are grateful that you are in control of the natural world and the spiritual world, and we put our trust in you. And Lord, we pray that we might have opportunities to be light to those who were lost. When we are at a doctor's office or we have a new caregiver, when something happens that we don't expect. Help us, Lord, to take opportunities to be light in those situations. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.